Hey gang, what's up? It's Wes. So today, kind of a special day. January 15th, 2022. It's my birthday. I'm 36 years old. And I do say old. I'm getting that white in the beard. But hey, I earned it. That's the way I see it. Um, so a huge thank you, by the way, to my wife for setting up a whole bunch of balloons and presents and all that stuff. So a lot of fun. It's already off to a great start, but it's going to continue because we're going to be doing something a little bit different for the YouTube video for this week. I know this comes out after the January 15th, but eh, it is what it is. Um, so as you all know, whenever I work professionally, I 100% of the time work digitally. And I'm a big proponent of using traditional painting methods in bringing that over to my digital art. But can that work the other way? Can you really primarily be a digital artist and take some of that workflow and work traditionally? Hmm. So that's what we're going to do this time. We're going to be doing a, a little, uh, I think I have an 8 by 10 uh, canvas. Uh, it might even be smaller than that, actually. Um, we're just going to do a quick oil painting uh, after the cool little intro. I'm going to show you all the supplies that we're going to be using. Then we're going to be doing just some generic time-lapse stuff. I'll be doing narration over it. Um, I'm really excited about this because I think there's a lot of kind of combativeness within the communities of art. So sometimes you have your traditional or real artists over here that say, hey, the digital stuff's not, you know, it doesn't take any skill or, you know, the computer does it for you. But then also the digital artists are like, oh, these old relics that only want to work in their traditional mediums and who's got that kind of money, who's got that kind of time. So, you know what, I'm gonna bring people together. It's my birthday, I'm allowed to do it. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to bring everybody together. But let's talk about using the same workflow that we might use digitally and how we approach a digital piece of art and then going forward and doing something traditional. So without further ado, let's get to it. Let's talk shop, let's talk supplies. So of course we need a canvas. Yeah, this is a tiny canvas. It's not even eight by 10. Um, six by nine, maybe? Probably six by nine. Yeah, I don't know. Anyway, doesn't matter. <laughs> just, just something small we can get a painting done in a day, uh, even an oil painting. We're gonna be working in the a la prima style. Um, here, let me set that over there. Uh, we're going to be working in the a la prima style, which means wet on wet paint. We're not going to wait for layers to dry. We're not going to wait for any of that type of stuff. Um, and what we're going to do is we're going to work in the same methodology that I do on my digital work. I'm going to start off with a very basic landmarking. So um, I am using this reference image courtesy of Adobe stock photo. And I actually got inspired to do this painting in particular and the way that I'm going to be doing it based on Cynthia Shepard. As you all know, I'm a huge Cynthia Shepard mark. I love her art. I love her uh, just painting ability and just uh, all, all things art coming from Cynthia Shepard. Big fan of hers. So she actually did this painting as well using the same palette I'm going to be using. So really, this is doing a few things. Number one, I know it's possible because I've seen a pro do this same painting. However, I also want to compare my methodology and the way that I work with a pro that I look up to to see if there's anything that I can improve on. So it's almost like an athlete looking at tape, going in and being like, okay, let's let's watch the tape of our, not necessarily opponents in a uh, artistic way, but maybe someone you're looking up to. How do they approach problem solving? So I'm gonna be doing that um, but I'm actually going to be doing that part after I get done with my painting. I don't want to kind of, I guess, taint my the, the methodology that I'm going to use by trying to emulate her beforehand, if that makes sense. So anyway, that's probably going to happen off camera. If you are interested in seeing kind of that comparison deal, let me know. And that can maybe be a separate video. Who knows? But to continue on with the, uh, with the supplies here, we're actually going to be transferring... 
um, our idea with this nice, um, my wife actually got me these for Christmas as part of a big like Christmas bundle deal. The Mark Art Professional Sketch Pencils. Um, so this actually comes with all kinds of different sizes and yeah, the 4H uh, all the way to the 12B. I'm not gonna use a whole lot of them. Probably, um, I would say a 4B and 6B. 6B to get the, uh, since it's a little thicker and a little rougher, the main outlines and then maybe 4B or maybe even the 2B to go in and kind of put in the eyes, maybe the shadow of the nose, stuff like that. Uh, so we're gonna transfer that onto that canvas and then I'm gonna do this step. Now this is a step that's not necessary However, I really like doing this. Um, this is CoverMax. It's acrylic clear coat. Now, um, what this will do is make a nice thin layer of sealant on top of my sketch to make sure that those, those graphite lines do not start smudging once I put paint over it. And what I'll also be doing is I will, let me grab it real quick. I will also be... I will also be putting a gesso coat after I do this. So I'm gonna sketch, I'm gonna seal it, and then I'm gonna put the gesso over it, a very light coat of uh, gesso. So we're, we're gonna, we are gonna show that part of the process during the time lapse, but um, basically what that's going to mimic is working in layers digitally, right? So you have, let's say your line art, and then you make a new layer and you start doing your, your essentially your painting stuff. That's kind of what this emulates. You're going to put your line art down, you're going to seal it so it doesn't move, it's almost like locking your layer, and then you're gonna work on top of that. So um, that's gonna actually help me quite a bit whenever I start putting down my main marks because I get to quote unquote color in the lines and then once we get all the paint on there, it's all covered, then I can kind of forget about that sketch and uh, just kind of paint what I see. So we got that right here. And speaking of painting, what we're gonna be doing and what we're going to be using is going to be only three pigments. So we are going to be using the Ander Zorn palette, but we're gonna remove the yellow ochre. So all we're gonna be working with is going to be ivory black, titanium white, in cadmium red. So this is actually cad red hue. Um, yeah, like I uh, talked about before, the toxicity of stuff I'm not a big fan of. So I always just go for the hues. All I need is the, the, the color, the hue, the pigment. So I don't really need real cadmium red. Um, a cadmium red hue for me is absolutely fine. And then we're going to use something, and oh, I'm so excited to open this. I haven't opened a bottle of this in years, um, but it is my favorite medium ever, 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 ever. Um, and ironically, it's also what Cynthia Shepard uses. But um, a lot of people use this and for very good reason. I know Andrew Tischler does as well. Um, Liquin Original. So I don't know if you can even see kind of uh, how the lighting and stuff is. This is essentially honey. This paints like you added the smoothest, nicest honey to your paint in the world. It's so nice. It improves drying time, which is going to be cool. Um, it also, let's see, it adds a little bit more gloss to really get that nice pop effect. But primarily what this does is this affects and impacts the spreadability of the paint. So these Windsor & Newton, even if they're water soluble, they come out pretty thick. They come out pretty thick paint, which is good, especially if we want to get some impasto, some nice thick texture. But what Liquin's going to do is make sure that a little bit of our paint goes a long, long way. Um, and then, yeah, we're just going to use a variety of brushes, um, some flats, some filberts. I have some rounds. And we're just going to take that to quote unquote final. This is more of just a quick oil painting just to get myself back into the habit of doing it. I would like to do um, a few oil paintings a month, but because of my work schedule, because of the YouTube, because of all these other commissions and things like that, I primarily still work digitally. However, I just like the idea of taking all the stuff that I'm doing digitally and being able to transfer that workflow over to the uh, traditional side. So yeah, that's all of our stuff right there. And then, um, yeah, after that, we're just going to let it dry. And then, um, you know, uh, I say let it dry. Uh, oil paint, ironically, does not dry. There's no water in it. 
So what it does is it oxidizes and that process takes a long time. So even a small painting like this, even with liquid that speeds up the, the quote unquote drying time, I bet this will probably be touch dry within about 72 hours. But to be fully oxidized and fully kind of sealed to where there's no little ripples of the fat moving around from the oils and stuff is probably going to take upwards of about 8 to 10 months. Months! It's crazy. Oil's nuts, man. Um, <laughs> but so, yeah, we're going to do it. Then we're going to talk about it. We're going to talk about the process while we're doing the process and while I film these different steps. Uh, but maybe the most important step of all and it's gonna kick off our time lapse. I need to make some coffee. So we have our trusty sketch here. You can see the coffee cup right there. <laughs> so yeah, I'm watching this back time lapsed. Um, yeah, I just have my iPad. I have the uh, stock image open in Procreate, not to really paint over it or anything, but just to kind of be able, you know, I know how to use Procreate now, so I can zoom in out and change stuff if I need to, but I get it kind of where I want it in relation to my canvas and I start sketching. So first off, I use kind of the 4B pencil and go in and just do random lines. I like to work a little diagonal whenever I landmark this stuff. This is how I'm actually starting to work uh, digitally as well. I will go in and if I have a reference, what I do is I just put some geometric shapes in there and see if I can kind of get the proportion as far as how shapes relate to each other instead of worrying too much about exact proportions. So. Uh, I'm, I'm in this weird place. I say it's a weird place, but it's actually probably pretty good um, for, for artistic growth where I want to use reference, but I want to also not be beholden to it completely. Um, I want to stylize it slightly. I want to change some of the angles. I want to change some of the, the depth and stuff like that because what this is going to help me do, I feel, is... Uh, I don't know, put some slight imagination on just looking and copying reference. And as you can see now, I'm going through with a 6B pencil through the main outlines of these shapes. And uh, the sketch overall I felt was okay. I felt it was fine. It felt like the reference. It looked, you know, close enough to the reference. But primarily what it did is it gave me a sense of landmarking to be able to push forward. But now that we have this sketch in here, uh, I need to seal it. I need to make sure I seal it so it doesn't spread out everywhere. So we got the sketch down, we got it gessoed, it is ready to rock and roll. It's been drying for about half an hour now, still smells a little bit like that uh, sealer that we have. It smells like paint thinner really, <laughs> but uh, but you know, once we open that liquid, that's really going to uh, make the, the house smell, um, but it's a good smell. Uh, but yeah, as you can see, we got the sketch down and um, what we have is you know just a basic landmarking sketch you can see kind of where i put a little bit of shadow just to give myself that cue in order to kind of look at it and uh 
you know, make sure it's going good. And then what's also nice is not only did, by, by gessoing it, not only did we prep the canvas for painting, but what we did is we lowered the opacity of the sketch. So once again, just like digital art, let's say you have a sketch layer, you have your line layer, you wanna temper that down a little, that way you can kind of see stuff come through it. What better way to, than to lower the opacity? So gesso can do that in real life. This was just one very thin coat. Normally, if it's a commission painting, something that I wanna put maybe in a gallery or something, I do probably four to six full on gesso passes just to really make sure uh, that my uh, that my canvas is prepped, it's smooth, and it's gonna take that paint really well. But this is rough and ready. Um, this is just uh, basically an a la prima, just really for YouTube, but just for practice, just to kind of enjoy the process. Um, but yeah, so we're ready to rock and roll. Another thing I wanted to tell you guys, so a lot of people will talk about palette. Like, what do you use for a palette? Now, I have a variety of palettes. I have a wet palette. Uh, it's like a little container that you can shut stuff in. That's usually for my heavy body acrylics. Um, also, I have kind of the nice Bob Ross easel palette type thing to where I can hold it and have it next to me and all this other stuff. But because we're gonna be sitting down, because we have all the film gear and stuff, uh, I will be sitting and I wanted to show you what I will be using. And if you wanna talk about a budget palette, mwah, this is perfect. So, the first things first, here is a cheap, cheap cutting board. It's a little plastic um, cutting board. It has, let's see, let's set that down. Some ridges and texture and stuff like that, but it's also, you can see all the cut marks on it. Um, and then you can also see where I've oil painted on it <laughs> before it's kind of seeped into that plastic. Um, Cause yeah, this is plastic. The nice thing about this is it allows, do I have my palette knife yet? Anyway. Um, it allows a palette knife to scrape really easy to get that off. But if you want to ease your cleaning stage, I guess, if you want to be able to clean up easier, the number one highest recommended thing I can think of, parchment paper. So a lot of people will go and they'll get the, they'll, they'll buy the, uh, the sheets of palette paper, I guess it's called. That's essentially what this is. The only difference is where the palette paper comes with maybe 20 or 30 sheets and it's about eight or nine dollars or whatever. You can get a roll of parchment paper that you can just tape to something like this, a dollar. And this is what, 50 square feet of roll? Um, you can get this, it's also called, um, there's a version of this called uh, butcher's paper, which is a little thinner. And also there's wax paper. Um, I've used all three. For painting, there's not really a big difference. I will say with the wax paper, it is pretty slick on the one side because of the wax. It does make maybe your brush uh, kind of slippy and slidey a little more, but I've just, the cheap non-stick parchment paper has been great for me. So yeah, if you want to get a nice paint palette that's super easy to clean on a budget, parchment paper is awesome. So now we're getting started on the real painting. I want to say this took a little over two hours. Uh, majority of this footage is sped up about 600%. And really what I do, you'll see that I kind of put the iPad there just to have it as that reference. And I really wanted to get in the midtones first. I wanted to just block in local color. I've been starting to do this more and more on my digital art is uh, something that I've heard from a few of my animator friends, they work for like Netflix and stuff like that, is they'll talk about putting in the flats first. And it's something that I think is a, a pretty smart move. You're really just putting in your flat mid-tones or your flat color, or essentially your local color uh, in first. So your local color sometimes is just referred to as color. So like if you have an apple, is it a green apple or a red apple? Or uh, the, the school bus, it's a yellow school bus. You know, that's what I, at least I refer to whenever I think of local color, is what is the color of the object before you get light or shadow or you start mixing any of that other stuff in there. Um, what, you know, what does this look like? So. It's funny, you can also see that I kind of go away from the canvas for a little bit and, you know, having <laughs> having a, you know, at this point almost an eight-month-old running around is kind of 
crazy but uh <laughs> um so yeah i kind of go in there and you know being being the parent and that's actually why i don't bring out my traditional art stuff very often is there's not a lot of time with, with digital it's great because you can just set down the stylus go do what you need to do and everything's exactly the same way you said it with traditional you know um everything's kind of laying out and you know that oil paints out there and you know little hands can get in it so <laughs> it's a little bit trickier to set up but anyway I, i'm just going through and i'm blocking in those main local colors and I, I feel okay about it right now where i start running into trouble i think is one of the main benefits of oil paint is also one of the things that i need to practice more and it deals with edges. As you can see, I kind of work up to the edge uh, with the reds and the grays, but they don't quite overlap. And once they do overlap, what's interesting is because uh, your, with the Zorn palette, the way it works is your dark and your light. So your, your, your uh, ivory black and your titanium white are both cool tone. They're both, both primarily on the cool side of the spectrum because they have blues in them. They're made primarily of blue. And then you start working in your reds, and you start working in your warms, you know, whenever you have your yellow ochre and your, uh, your scarlet or your vermilion or cadmium red hue uh, for what we have in this instance. Those are your warms. So those are gonna be on the warmer side, your oranges, your reds, things like that. Whenever those edges start co-mingling you get almost a sense of a green you get greens and you get purples because that's th those are mainly the colors that you get whenever you start mixing your warms and your cools and i like the look of it but it's also something that can kind of throw you off in relation to values so working in a very limited palette this way it's kind of nice but it's also you have to really know your value control because even adding a little bit of ivory black or titanium white is gonna strip some of that luminosity away from that, you know, the cadmium red hue. And in this instance, and like even going back and studying, um, you know, after I filmed this, I went back and I rewatched uh, Cynthia Shepherds. Her control of value is perfect. I mean, she, she gets it. She absolutely understands it. You can tell she's made hundreds and hundreds of paintings using limited palettes and she's just a natural when it comes to it and that's something that i still struggle with i still make it a paramount in my images to make sure my values are right and I, while i've gotten used to it on a digital sense while, while i feel way more comfortable working on values digitally working directly in color and value at the same time is a fun challenge it's a fun I don't know, there's a spontaneity to it and there's this creativity to it that working grayscale to color feels a little stoic now. It doesn't feel as rich, it doesn't feel as vibrant, but working in this way and seeing like the weird green happen around where the hood is meeting that background. I think it's really kind of fascinating. I, I think that, you know, paint has a life of its own. And while we have complete total control over stuff in a digital realm, I think working traditionally, you kind of have to let the chips fall where they may. And, you know, you, you can temper it, you can, you can try your best to get those edges and stuff like that, but every once in a while, the paint's going to surprise you. And as I'm starting to lay in kind of the, the lighter values here, it starts changing the relationship of what I already have on the canvas. So... While I worked uh, primarily in my midtones, even though I did block in some shadow um, and I'm blocking in a little bit of light now, I would still argue that these are my midtones. I don't think I have the full highlights on there yet or the full shadows. We're going to be adding those in there momentarily, but I do think it's an interesting. I don't know. You see some of the richness of those reds really start to pop because we added those desaturated colors. And I think, especially with the Zorn palette, that's where a lot of this um, comes into play, is not only are you working with warms and cools and stuff like that, but you're working with high saturation and low saturation. And that's something I want to take more into my digital stuff as well. 
maybe have some real big vibrant hits of color, but then have everything else kind of grayed out a little bit, kind of tone it back and uh, tint it and, you know, tone and all that stuff. There's a lot of fun to be had there. And I think working this way helps me understand more whenever I'm working on a digital piece as well. So I'm just going to let this play out for a minute and see if I can think about what was maybe going through my mind as I was going through this. I know I'm working on edges here, um, trying to get some of those shapes of the folds and stuff. But like I said, you know, while I'm working with the reference, I don't want to be so beholden to it that I don't make interesting decisions. Um, and really the thing I'm kind of proud of is you see where the hand that that foreground hand is now going into that shadow of the the cuff that big long cuff i wanted to make sure that was a lost edge i wanted to make sure that those shadows just melt into each other and you can see now is where i'm starting to really kind of come in and focus on edges by using those different values brought in a few of the pops of that red just to kind of really bring it in. It's so funny going back and comparing Cynthia's version of this to mine. Hers is so rich and mine still feels very flat and I think it's because I don't know. I'm I'm guess I'm more worried about the shape and I also don't have the the subtlety of changes from kind of that less saturated red to the more saturated. See, and I'm adding almost these sketch lines as far as shadow is concerned. So this is primarily just that ivory black with a little hit of that red, <coughs> excuse me, that red, because I don't want to work in pure black and pure white. I think that also kind of flattens and kind of kills any mood. So that was something that I wanted to kind of keep on the front of my mind is, hey, mix a little bit of color in with everything. Um, kind of make it sing a little bit more. So if I were to work digitally on this. It's, you know, we're kind of that big shadow, that cast shadow from the hood going over the top of the skull. That would be a, a quick little, oh, I'm just going to get a smudge tool or I'm going to get a lower opacity brush and just kind of brush it on there. But I wanted to keep the clarity of shape on the oil painting, but I also realized that it doesn't quite look right. It makes it, I don't know, everything looks very boxy right now which is fine and it, it's something you, you can work with. But I do think it really showcases that my proportions aren't quite right on the face. And I think that ends up bugging me throughout this entire, <laughs> this entire piece. Um, Yeah, my thing is just proportions, man. I really need to work on it. I really, what I need to do is I need to fill up some sketchbooks. I know that's one of my New Year's resolutions is to sketch more. And primarily it's because of reasons like this. Like I know I said I don't want to be completely beholden to the reference, which is true. But what I've noticed is my art can kind of go into that weird uncanny valley to where because proportions aren't quite right, or maybe the eyes are a little too big, or the nose isn't quite right, or the mouth's a little too high, or you know, the, the form of the face is the structure of it slightly off. It draws attention away from the mood. And you at least to me, and you know, we're our we're our own worst critics, but at least to me, you kind of beeline to the mistakes. And you're like, oh man, the face isn't right. <laughs> um I don't know, maybe it's something I need to get over. Or just get better. You know, that's part of this. Yeah, now I'm going and kind of working on that face and 
you know, of course, it's easy to say as a digital painter, you just go in and, you know, liquefy that bad boy. Liquefy it into place, make it look good. Um, but I do think it, it's, I don't know, it adds to the responsibility as an artist to, to not have those type of tools every now and then. Um, even though it doesn't quite look right, I was still having fun. And I think that's one of the more important things. It's such a, a breath of fresh air being able to work in traditional media. Even though I have a lot of work to do on it to get to a level that I feel comfortable and confident that I can do commission work and stuff like that, primarily in traditional. Um, I don't know. It's just fun. There's something liberating about it. It's scary. It's scary in a way that digital art isn't. And here I was like, oh, maybe I can go in and add some cool leading lines in the background. And I think it was the right move. However, I don't think I went uh, crazy enough. I don't think I went dark or light enough. I think I just tried to keep it fairly mid-tone. I should have just did straight or pretty close to straight black and straight white. And I think that would have added a different dimension to kind of what the piece is. Look at my hand, man. I, I, I guess my handle on one of my brushes had that red on it. <laughs> and my hand looks ridiculous right now. There's my trusty cloth that has oil paint all over it. I don't know how I'm going to wash that thing. Definitely not in the... <laughs> not with a load of clothes, I'll tell you that. I don't want to get any of that oil on anything else. So if anyone in the in the comments has a way, I mean, I might just toss that cloth. Who knows? But if anyone has any cleaning advice for how to get all that oil out of there, let me know. Um, So I'm pushing a little more of the edges now, kind of going and sketching. And I do notice that I like sketching at the end as much as I like sketching at the beginning of a piece. I think that's where I can really go and refine edges, I can refine shapes, and I think it's a lot of fun because it's a, it's a good way to reinforce structure. And it, it's definitely a thing that I'm taking into my digital stuff as well. Just going in and kind of refining these shapes. So here's one of the things of working smaller. Your small brush is still fairly large in regards to the size of the canvas. So it's really hard to go in and get that exact, you know, quote unquote, pixel perfect line. And you know, oil paint, it has oil in it. It's going to be slightly runny and, and, and kind of meld into itself. And there's an inherent beauty to that, but also it doesn't make for good exacting, you know, of a line for an eyebrow or the hair or whatever. Like it can, but you just have to work larger. And that, that, once again, that's another lesson to take. If you want more crisp line art or crisp edges on your digital piece, Make your canvas bigger. Just start working on a larger canvas. And that way your two to three pixel brush size really will be a super fine point, you know, on a 10,000 width canvas, as opposed to, you know, if it was only a thousand, you know what I mean? So it's something to think about. It's something interesting, just, all of it works together. The size of the canvas, your brush size, how much loading is on the brush. It helps me reaffirm my process digitally. And here we go. And here are some of the final, final, final touches that I do. This one's actually in real time. You can actually see the uh, iPad back there where I'm coming in. I'm using my pinky as kind of a brace there. And then I have a little bit 
of kind of a fade here that I wanted to do. I don't have any blenders or anything like that. So I just wanted to make a nice gray as a transition to kind of smooth out the planes of the face. And overall, I mean, I am happy with it. This was only about two hours, like I said. So in two hours, I got what I needed out of this. I definitely know I need to work on proportion and stuff like that. But here, momentarily, I am going to do a wrap up, just kind of narration to the video. But hope you found a little something from this process. Um, yeah, I'm happy with it. It's not my best painting I've ever done. Um, and now I'm adding those real dark darks in there. Uh, it's not my best painting, but hey, it's great practice, um, and I did learn a lot, so yeah, good times. So that is a wrap two hours um, for this one right here. Overall, I like it okay. Um, I will say that what was really, really, really difficult, and you guys probably saw it on the time-lapse part, is since the canvas is so small, even my smallest brushes couldn't get kind of that fine line detail. Really where I think the biggest thing happened, when the, the uh, size and the, the kind of structure of the face is a little off, which is okay, you know, it is what it is. Um, I think the sketch had it a little bit more with better kind of structural integrity, but with the painting, you know, you get in there and some of the brushwork does, does different stuff and going in and refining it, especially just having about two hours to paint. It's not a lot of time. Um, that's still no excuse. I just need to get better at proportions. Um, <laughs> but yeah, painting over the structure lines, it was helpful. However, um, this is like if you were using a digital art uh, suite or something and you got to this point, this is where I would recommend using the liquify tool. Uh, getting a liquify tool, maybe bringing this eyebrow um, out a little bit, maybe just structuring the face a little more, um, kind of tilting everything slightly a little bit. Um, overall, I am pretty happy with the texture that we got on the, um, on the kind of the cloak area right there. Um, I do like the fact that there were some brush strokes that I just like the look of, like this one in particular, um, just coming out and jutting out the side and really a lot of the background stuff. It's funny now that, you know, this is a day later and the oil is still very, very wet. So that's why I'm trying to be careful and <laughs> not get it on everything. Um, but and, you know, the hands aren't quite as exact as I would like, but they, they read okay. I think really with hands, that's why drawing hands is so difficult is because in my opinion, hands need light. They need the form structure. So unless you're doing contour lines or unless you really get in there and render a hand, the hand is gonna look odd. But getting just the shapes of the values in there makes it look fairly believable. It has that nice little glow um, there, which is kind of what I was after. But yeah, really my main thing is I would work bigger. And I think that's another thing to uh, take into my digital stuff is maybe I need to work bigger there as well. Because that way, you know, a, a two or three pixel brush on, uh, you know, 1000 by 1500 canvas is going to look one way because it takes up a bigger real estate. Those three or four pixels are a bigger percentage of a thousand pixels than they would be of seven or eight thousand pixels. So to get really fine detail, work bigger. Um, the, the colors I actually like, okay, I like the fact that we used a limited palette. And that's something that I want to take more into uh, my, and I've been doing it lately, which is why I kind of had this idea to go and do the Cynthia Shepard Adobe stock uh, kind of a study, is I've been doing more limited palettes and I'm liking the feel and the look, and you have a lot of control over that. Um, but yeah, a lot of fun. And hey, this was only two hours, you know, so it may not be the greatest oil painting that's ever existed, 
But in two hours, I have a tangible piece of art that I can hand to somebody as a gift or hang it on the wall or whatever. It exists. There's no extra printing costs. There's no extra anything like that. It's just here, you know, you let it um, kind of oxidize for the next month or so. Um, after about two months, two or three months, it should be fairly safe to varnish. Um, but yeah, this will be touch dry in about three to four days, I would guess. And that's even with liquid, um, which speeds up drying time. Without liquid, it would take about a week or so um, to fully, or not oxidize, but to fully touch dry. But yeah, it's a fun little experiment. I want to do more of these. Um, I, I think using the same methodology about working and kind of blocking out landmarks, then putting in value, and I did value and color in the same pass this time. Maybe I need to do that for my uh, more digital stuff. Normally I would do more of the black and white, kind of refine that render a little bit within the grayscale, and then kind of splash color on top with either a color overlay layer, a regular overlay layer, or a multiply layer for the darks. But maybe, I don't know, maybe just working straight in color. Maybe I'm at that point now. Maybe I just need to experiment, work in color, get some cool blends, and kind of uh, see what that's like. But yeah, overall for two hours, man, I'm pretty happy with it. Um, like I said, uh, there are some things I would like to fix. I think, you know, lightness isn't exactly like the stock photo. But I'm also trying to get away from going for perfect likeness. Just because, you know, I'm a painter, I'm not a photographer. So there's, there's that difference of being a, a, a translator and an interpreter, and I'm kind of juggling that right now. That's a big thing for 2022 as well. Um, I just want to focus on that, getting a little bit more lively in the way my stuff looks and don't adhere so much to the, uh, to the, to the stock photo or the reference, whatever reference I might be using. But yeah, here's a little painting, you know, it's a lot of fun. Um, I do recommend it. So if you're primarily a digital painter and you have not tried traditional stuff, I highly, highly recommend it because you're really going to put your thought process to the test. You're going to see, is the way that I work the most, uh, is it a way that can be replicable? Can I repeat it? Do I work the same way in a sketchbook that I do with watercolor or oil or acrylic, pastels, charcoal? Um, it really lets you kind of play around and the the feel is just different. There's nothing quite like getting nice, good quality oil paint and liquid and putting it on a canvas. There, you can't replicate it. As hard as I want to try doing it on digital painting, you cannot replicate it. Not to say it's better or worse, it's just different. Um, but that being said, if you are on the other side of the coin, if you're an oil painter or acrylic or watercolor and you haven't jumped to digital, hopefully this shows you that you can approach your same methodology here, and we're gonna do a video probably in the next month or so about my favorite method of digital painting. Um, it's very difficult, but it's super rewarding, and it's gonna take all those naysayers that say, oh, you know, digital art and digital painting isn't real painting. I can prove that it is, so be on the lookout for that. But, uh, but yeah, overall, here we go. Um, nice little oil piece for you. But let me know what you think in the comments. Are you one of those artists like myself that likes to jump back and forth between traditional and digital? Or do you really firmly stay on one side of the coin or the other? Are you just strictly a traditional artist? Hey, I wanna make stuff for a gallery. Um, you know, my, my livelihood depends on it. Or is it, hey, I'm just gonna use digital. All my clients or my commissions, they want it digital to reproduce it easy. Um, kind of where are you at on that? I'd like to know. But hey, that's my time. I'm Wes. Uh, hit me up on all the socials. You'll see the banner down here. It's Art of Wes Gardner on uh, Twitter, on Instagram, and on TikTok. Your boy joined TikTok, so I'll do some like dances or something. I don't know. That's what the kids do on TikTok, right? Anyway, until we meet again, go out there, go make cool stuff. Peace.